Oscar from Disguise and Galinga. And I am going to hand it over to you, Addy. Tell us about some nerfs. Uh, thanks, Jess. Hello, everyone. So uh, the two companies represented here, Valenga uh, to my left and right, and I'm Addy with Disguise. We did an incredibly successful webinar just a few weeks ago on nerfs. There's been a lot of interest on what it is, how it's used, and where it's going. So we want to share all this info with you. Super excited. So let's get right into it. Uh, quickly going to introduce who I am. If you're in LA, you probably know me by now. Uh, I am w the Vice President of Virtual Production with Disguise, and I'll go through what we do. Uh, to my left, I have Fernando. Hi, Avi. Hi, everyone. I'm Fernando, co-founder of Bolinga, and also leading the product development of Bolinga. And I have Orlando on my right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm co-founder of Bolinga and chief uh, scientific officer of Bolinga. And these gentlemen are from the Canary Islands. So <laughs> we're <laughs> a very exotic place. Uh, we we're super happy to have them here in LA for Production Summit. And thank you, Jess, and everybody on the team for having us on stage. Excellent. So Disguise is a global technology company. We make a tech platform that powers, believe it or not, hundreds of VP stages, virtual production stages around the world. We have uh, an incredible history with live events. If there is any big show on the planet, let's say a Taylor Swift or a Drake or a Beyonce, it's being powered by Disguise. Uh, we have also presence in broadcast. We power the ESPN stage. And if there's a big film shoot going on with the car process, chances are it's using a disguise server. So that's who we are. And I'm going to go into Bolinga, a little bit of history there. Yeah, well, uh, Bolinga is a startup which, which has been out from a Spanish company, Akimia. Um What we do, or our vision is uh, we want to Unleash NERF, unleash the power of, of NERF, um, make everyone uh, capable of use NERFs. Um, we provide now different seamless integrations for both creation and real time rendering of NERF in different uh, softwares and different platforms. And yet, one of them is these guys. Um, a month ago, we, we announced an integration with these guys, which is having a, quite a good uh, reception. And yeah. We're pretty excited to tell you. Very excited. So one of the key advantage to Disguise is it's the opposite of sort of like an Apple, like a closed ecosystem. We're actually a very open and widely easily integrated ecosystem. We have hundreds of integrations, and the most exciting ones for us is obviously uh, Valinga and all of the latest AI tech. Um, so Valinga's uh, SaaS so solution drives right into our servers, which go right up onto a stage like this. So it makes it way, way easier for productions to actually use and harness the latest technology. Orlando, you want to talk a little bit about sort of the motivation and history of why you guys were founded and what your mission statement is? Yeah, we started with uh, NERF in 2020. You, if you know uh, the original paper, scientific paper that um, uh, published for the first time this concept uh, was uh, uh, done by Google and the University of Berkeley. That was back in 2020. We started to, we spotted as very promising concept uh, that was going to revolutionize computer, computer graphics and uh, the audiovisual sector in general. And we started to work on, on, on that, to research on that. So we are researchers. Uh, our background is research and engineering. And yeah, we started in 2020. And for three years, we were researching different use cases and different challenges. And then at some point, that I guess we will talk about that later, we decided that it was uh, uh, the time to bring this technology. It was mature enough to bring it to uh, solve uh, problems in the production, virtual production domain. And that's that's how we created it, to bring this uh, awesome technology to professionals and to put it in the hands of professionals. Absolutely, and we interface with all of our customers and on the, and their virtual art department teams, and there is just an incredible need for photorealistic 3D environments and photorealistic content. And Volinka is, you know, a excellent promise in supplying that incredible demand. So I'm going to hand it over to Fernando to explain just at a very high level what a nerf is. So that'll sort of kick us off into this tech exploration. 
Okay, so um, basically, we can think of an app as an AI that ingests different images, different 2D images from a scene. It can be coming from a video, it can be coming from, from different photographs. And this AI, these neural networks, learns how to represent the 3D content of the scenes. Not only the geometry, but also the specularities, reflections, everything. We like to see NEF as an intersection of machine learning, because it's using a neural network, computer graphics, because it's using a lot of computer graphics techniques and rendering techniques, and also generative AI, because what we are doing is generating new content from existing one. Yeah, one way that, you know, this, this is a million dollar question. Um, it's so different to conventional computer graphics primitives that is difficult to for people to understand, even for ourselves when we started. And one way, one method for or analogy to explain it is that this is, um, we use machine learning to learn the pixels in an image. So what you do is basically you take multiple pictures of a scene and then obviously you take the pixels from those pictures. So now the neural network will have the task of learning uh, what each pixel, the color of each pixel from the position and the orientation of the camera. So now once the neural network is built for that scene that was trained with those pictures of that specific scene, uh, now that model, we can use it to ask for pixels from an arbitrary position of the camera. So now we can say to the neural network, give me all the pixels of an image for this camera in this position and in this orientation and with these properties, uh, optics uh, of the camera. You see, so we take the pic pixels of all those pictures and we train the model. And now you have a model that is gonna be able to generate and imagine, so to speak, the pixels of an arbitrary arbitrary uh, camera, a camera moving arbitrarily in a, in a 3D space. I believe that's called a novel perspective, right? Novel view synthesis, yeah. Yes. So as a NERF user, and I have been using Valinga to generate NERFs, uh, my best understanding of a NERF, uh, this is just sort of my expression, is it's a way simpler way to represent physical real worlds without doing the work. <laughs> So uh, I've used uh, Reality Catcher in the past. Uh, you know, uh, I've worked with AR and VR companies, and it's a lot of time, a lot of work, and it takes a lot of skill to get the right output. Whereas Nerves, at the machine learning, the AI does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So super excited about that. Excellent. And then it's also important to understand what Nerf is not, right? So walk us through some of those. Yeah. Well. One of the first things is it's not the next version of photogrammetry. If you are expecting to have, um, we are going to talk about it a bit later, but if you're expecting to have different materials, different textures, you're expecting to have polygons to work on it, it is not. This is a new, as Orlando said before, this is a new computer graphics primitive, and it's not photogrammetry, it's another new thing. Yeah, Orlando, anything to add to what we should not expect from a NERF asset? Yeah, you cannot expect meshes. Uh, you cannot expect conventional primitives. And this is a little bit confusing because there are some, well, plenty of research and people trying to do a hybrid solution. So we, we, we have been thinking about how we can reuse all the computer graphics knowledge and techniques in this new paradigm from the scientific side, you know? Uh, so there are mm, plenty of experiments uh, making this hybridization, so to speak, between NERF um, and the concept of radial fields uh, with meshes, with polygons, with voxels. So, um, but as an, is, uh, I think it's important to understand that this is a different thing. And then we will currently are uh, doing research and engineering on. Uh, understanding how we can use meshes and, and the role that meshes are going to have. For example, for relighting, it seems that they, they may be necessary. Um, so, but NERF is not a way of getting meshes of 
reconstruction Absolutely. based on meshes. This is process. the part that broke my mind the first time <laughs> I learned about NERFs. So NERFs have all the usability of a full 3D geometry or parametry, but with none of the weight, if that makes sense. There is no vertices, no meshes. Actually, there's no UV maps. There isn't. No textures, but it's everything a photogrammetry asset is without all of that complexity. It's mind boggling. So your brain has to almost work <laughs> in a different way to use it. And uh, the conventional things like, oh, I could just change the texture map. No, you can't. There is no texture map. Or I can optimize the geometry to run faster. There is no geometry. Things like that, right? Exactly. And I also would like to explain that even though NEF is awesome, I think we are still on research. We will talk about the, the, the limitations. And there are still some things that you have to take care about when you are creating, uh, working, and capturing NEFs. And that's what we say. It's still not the almighty 3D generation method. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Again, still yeah, possible? I, yeah. Go ahead, Roland. Yeah, I think we need to be very uh, realistic and humble regarding NERF. It's a three years old baby that is already running, which is quite surprising, but it's three years old. Uh, so there are hundreds of universities and research centers uh, in private companies and public institutions doing research on it. So every year we get uh, hundreds of papers in NERF. Um, so we are still figuring out how to manage this uh, primitive representation, and there is, there is a lot of work to do, um, uh, but results are very surprising for a three years old technology. Absolutely, and you know it's an important distinction that I represent the world of production and you real use cases, putting things up to run for days and hours and weeks and having things really be reliable, whereas the gentleman to the left and right of me come from the world of research where they're at the complete cutting edge of what's possible. And those two things are colliding on stage here today. Excellent, so we have some videos here. Let's see if it plays back. Fernando, walk us through what we're looking at. Yeah, what we want to show here on the left is the original footage to create an F, to create out to an F. You can see that's just a video walking on this uh, corner of the house. On the right, we saw the NEF being used in an actual arbitrary state, powered by these guys on Plateau no in Barcelona. And you can see that the the way from going to the left, from the left video to the right one, is just uploading this video to our platform Bolinga, waiting for an hour, and you got that running on your stage. The nice thing here, and we'll go through this in the virtual production section, is when you put a nerf up on a volume like that, you're getting parallax. And I know it doesn't sound like a big deal. It's a huge deal <laughs> if you're shooting in camera because it's going to look real. Our eyes are so susceptible to the lack of parallax that when we look at uh, content made that's flat, immediately something breaks and we think it's fake. So having that little bit of parallax is going to make all the difference in a production. All right, and then let me go to the next slide here. Yeah, Orlando, walk us through what we're working on and what can be improved. Yeah, for the application of NERF in virtual production, we, we see um, two important challenges here. The I, I'm going to start with the second one, is free lighting. So once you capture, you learn, or the neural network learns, the pixels, uh, you cannot tell, uh, at, at least in principle, the neural network to render the pixels for an arbitrary position with a different illumination. That's, that's really a huge drawback, that you cannot change the illumination. Uh, it, it's giving you a realistic illumination, so for challenging environments where the uh, light is behaving really uh, in a complex way, it's a great way of capturing that behavior, but then you cannot change that behavior. You cannot change the light source. That That's confusing for uh, uh, creators and artists and people uh, accustomed to 3D. Um, but we are working on and researching on how we can uh, do that change in the lighting. So we can tell the neural network, for example, we provide an environmental map a different one from the one that was during uh, capture, during filming, 
uh, capturing, uh, and, and then to tell the neural, the neural network to render that uh, the, the camera f with a different environmental map. We are working on that research and as many other researchers. Uh, yeah, so for example, if you capture the Hollywood Hills during the day, uh, but your production says we need golden hour lighting, we could hopefully do that very soon. Yeah, exactly. That that that's one of the things and um, flexibilities that we that we need. Um, I think we didn't say so at the beginning, but it's I very important to understand also that this is getting really popular. Not only because it's really fast um, to create a model, uh, but because we capture complex behavior of the light, so transparencies, reflection, reflections. And these kind of things, and and to capture a a, be a complex behavior of a complex scene, uh, and to render it in, in Unreal Engine is going to take a lot of time. Uh, different professionals first to take out the light, and then to add the light and to simulate the light in the rendering engine, which is very interesting and. It will pose some philosophical questions, I think, in the future. We are like extracting the light, and then we are simulating the light currently. Yes. But with NERF, it's it is not like that. Uh, the neural network is learning how the light is behaving, so it's going to imagine how the light is behaving from any perspective. So NERF is very convenient for for situations where you cannot use photogrammetry, where replicating the behavior of the light is very very difficult. So that's one of the, uh, I think, um, best uh, advantages of NERF right now. Awesome. And then, Fernando, talk us through from a production perspective, because we are up against you know, other types of content. So color spaces matter, dynamic range, bit depth, all those things matter. What are we working on there? Exactly. <coughs> I think in the previous talk, uh, Kimball from, from Weta made a really good point. Machine learning is used to work with PNGs, JPEG, but we at the media entertainment industry, we, are, we don't work with that. We use EXR files. So there is also a, an effort that has to be made. It's not that research, but it's most an industry, an industry effort to standardize all these pipelines using NERFs and make NERFs use EXR, high dynamic range images, color space. I believe this is going to, to happen pretty soon. We are working on it. Uh, but still, there is some limitation there at this current moment. Right, so for example, if you throw up a nerf on a volume and you shoot it in camera, then how do you know that that is direct 2020, for example? Right now, you won't probably know. Yeah, so th that's that's the area of exactly. improvement that we need to, <laughs> and I'm sure it, that problem will be solved. <laughs> Excellent, so uh, switching gears now, we have this incredible new tool. It's being perfected and dialed in and how is this better than some of the tools that we have? And as technologists and creatives in here, we're all after the latest and greatest tools to make our lives easier. So here's a graph that I'll have Fernando walk us through. Yeah, basically, I think this is a pretty graphical example on how, how much work you have to do with NES. Compared with traditional 3D modeling or photogrammetry, uh, the, the existing pipelines, with NERS, you just have to capture the, the, the data. We are going to go through it later, uh, but it will take five minutes, 10 minutes being really slow. <laughs> and then you will have to wait just 30 minutes, one hour to, for processing. You can also make it longer if you want higher quality. But in this case, once you, you have done this, you're done. I mean, we do have an embol file ready. Embol, by the way, is the file we are using for NES right now. And you are done. You have something that you can put on your state and look photoreal and have parallax. Um, so it takes a matter of an hour, two hours, compared with maybe weeks of the other pipelines. Yeah, and the important thing here is um, the amount of people that are touching this, right? With photogrammetry, you have maybe one person that captured it, another person that's the solve artist, and then another person that's optimizing. With 3D modeling, right? imagine building a real world, let's say downtown LA, you know, each and one of those buildings are being modeled, brought in, texture shaded, then lit, um, 
artists. So that's probably 50, 60 different artists. This is very use case specific. So if you're recreating a sci-fi environment, obviously Nerf is maybe not the right choice. Uh, you're gonna have to build everything from scratch anyway. However, if your shot calls for just downtown LA as it is today, mm -hmm. I think Nerf is an excellent choice there, so, right? Actually, all of the examples that we're going to see and the examples we have shown was captured by only one person and sent to a studio. That's all. Yep. And then let's get into some of the inner mechanics of a nerf. So there is sort of a best practice guide, and you know we have the experts here, so walk us through it. Yeah, I think one of the key takeaways of this talk that we want you to have is how do you start capturing nerfs, and how do I create a nerf? Um, an important and critical point of nerf creation is data capturing. So it is really similar to photogrammetry. So if you are used to capture data for, for photogrammetry, you can apply all this knowledge. But summing up, the most important thing is avoid blur blurry regions, either using either because of motion blur or either because you are have out of focus focus regions. And also, always search for parallax. Don't stop what you are capturing. Don't pan the camera. Just move around the objects uh, and look at the one object from different point of views. Then using uh, a fair amount of images, 80, 100 uh, works, uh, make, make the NF work. And also using high resolution. It doesn't have to be ultra high, like 4K or 8K. 180 is, is already good. But yeah, don't go to, I don't know, 720. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the good, like, good examples there is um, I, I was building a Nerf, and I was using my red Komodo, and it's always set to cinematic, right? It's always set to 24 and 180, because that's what I always use it for. And I captured a Nerf, and the resulting frames were just a little too blurry, and it just resulted in a terrible Nerf. The minute I switched the red Komodo to 120 at a lower resolution, it was like, night and day difference. I like to see this from another perspective, more machine learning. And yeah, as in with any machine learning model, you need to feed it with, you need to train it with high quality data. So a perspective to see this is that we are trying, we need to try it during capturing, during taking, when we are taking the pictures or the video, we are taking samples of those pixels that the neural network is gonna be trained with. So we are trying to capture the highest quality. And actually there's very interesting research about how to move uh, the camera, how to best sample that space regarding, I mean, perhaps we, I don't take all the pixels of, of all the cameras for training or where to position the camera. Uh, and that's a very interesting uh, research, but think about you are taking data for the machine learning to train, to learn the pixels, and then to generate the pixels in the future. Absolutely. OK, we have some videos here. Um, I'm yeah. Just play it and walk us through it. Sure. What, I, what we wanted to show here is some examples of NERF you can take uh, right away when you go out for, from this talk. And you can just use this video, upload to Bolinga, and you will get a high quality NERF. This is one of the first examples. I think this everyone should start doing this as a NERF. And it's orbiting around 360 in in an object in an object. So focus on something of interest. For example, in this case, this statue, and do three different heights with a video like I'm showing here. Uh, the 360, so the full turnaround of the object, and it will turn in a pretty good nerves. We will see the quality later. Yeah, always start with you know be object oriented. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. The rather than environment oriented for your first nerf, uh, or it'll be a little bit difficult of a learning curve. Exactly. Another good example. Okay. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> Another good example is capturing a wall. Graffiti looks crazy on nerfs, and it's just uh, similar. Doing three different uh, tracks, three different uh, lines uh, at three different heights. And that actually looks pretty good. We will see it later. But yeah, mm -hmm. you can see the, the, the original footage on the right. I yeah. didn't take a good care here. But you will see that the, the result is pretty cool. Yeah, in general, if you're translating yourself in space, the more you were translating it, the more parallax you're generating. So that's exactly what you're talking about. 
And you can see that no no stabilizer is required. I mean, I'm just walking here. <laughs> you can see my steps. Yeah. I mean, and that's the whole thing. If your camera is set to a high enough frame rate or you're taking stills, you you know, stabilizing it should should not matter because you're really going after a single frame. Yeah, sometimes it may look counterintuitive, especially for people with ex experience in photogrammetry, because what we're trying to avoid here is uh, uh, images that the neural network will find problems with because ambiguity or because from its per perspective in the way in which the neural network learns. So the takeaway here is that don't think much about the reason why a certain movement is better. Uh, obviously, we need to get that uh, those good practices from academia and from uh, practitioners, but don't think much about this is better because something. It, it's because it, ma the way in which the machine learning model is trained. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just keep practicing, I think. I yeah. Think. You will get a good yeah. intuition if you do some nafs. Or you can email Fernando. <laughs> Uh, one more. Okay, all good. Let's see if this loads. Well, what I think we should be seeing here is uh, how to capture an interior a room, which is usually a tricky, yeah. a tricky um, example because everyone wants, since you are searching for details, everyone's go through the walls and go pretty close to the walls of the of the interior. But what you should do is put your back. Uh, in the wall of the of the of the room, um, imagine there is, or if there is a school, but imagine there is a, a an object on the center of the room, and you just keep orbitating the room three different heights with your back in the wall, and uh, yeah, it will turn out pretty well. Now we can see. Okay, we have some quality, some internet. We have policy. some <laughs> network. There's a lot of people on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, but this these pixels. Well, this is still, for example, this one is the render uh, nav. So it, this is not actually the the footage I saw before. Yeah. We can see it there. Yeah. So again, okay. just as versatile inside the and outside and so on. So one one thing to note here is nothing is moving, and that's yeah. really important to understand. Nerves are not moving nerves just yet. Um, they're a moment in time representation of the real world. Snapshot. Yeah, ag again in academia, I mean, there, there, there is also some research about dynamic nerve, and it works. The problem with dynamic nerve right now, um, the scientific methods, is that they are not r real time. So you cannot re render in real time. So for picture production, if we want movement, it couldn't, uh, we couldn't render in real time. But in the future, in the near future, I hope next year, we will, Bolinga will be uh, able to deliver dynamic uh, nerves and, and to render those in, in real time. But uh, that's going to be awesome. And that's going to be a huge difference with respect to conventional 3D, because you are going to be able to capture not only the light, but uh, movement, uh, all kind of dynamism in that scene with the same EC. Awesome. So we talked a little bit about the best way to capture nerves, what nerves are some of the limitations, what we're working on. So we're diving right into the way it is today. How can we use it? So it's already being used quite a bit. Um, so talk us through this example. Yeah, this is a great example, example from Gary Eterna. Uh, follow them on Twitter. And they, uh, he basically has like a really cool 360 to nav. Uh, pipeline, and he just captured this using 360 images and create a nav of, of this whole environment in just yeah one hour and going to uh, walk around with. I think he's using Insta, an Insta camera. I think Insta 360. 360. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. This is basically the result you can get from from samples. Something that we can say also is that you don't need to use videos. It's just a video is just a convenient way of capturing frames and pictures. We, I mean, you need to extract frames, certain keyframes from that video in order to train the neural network. But the capturing process based on the use of video is much better. Yeah. It's, it, better in the sense of easier for you. Absolutely. Yeah, whatever is your workflow, use it if you're a photographer, be a photographer. Yeah. The, w the neat thing here is if you go to the middle of the video, you could see that uh, Volinga also integrates really nicely with Unreal. 
And if you're familiar with Unreal, you can use Sequencer to drive the camera how you want. So it's being treated like a 3D environment, even though there is no geometry or mesh. So exactly. that's the insane part. Exactly, you can see it here. Yeah. So that's in Sequencer. That's somebody, you know, keyframing the cameras where it needs to go. Um, and again, it feels like that environment exists in Unreal, but it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah, the challenge that in Bolingo we, we, we had to uh, overcome had to do with a real-time rendering. So again, you train the model, but now you need to render it. You need to render all the pixels of the image 24, 30 times per second. Uh, and you need to run the model, the neural network, uh, several times to get a single pixel. So it's a different kind of um, neural network when you run it. So it, it doesn't give you the full image in a single run. You need to run it several times. So that uh, needs a level of parallelism and a way of computing this in, a, in an efficient way, completely different to a conventional. Yeah, uh, it's almost like a, like a ray tracing pass. Like you can increase or decrease it's the number of iterations. Yeah, but mm. again, apples and oranges, right? Yeah, actually yeah. it uses uh, uh, ray marching. Yeah. Uh, from computer graphics. It, Bolinga is, as Fernando said, a mixture of uh, machine learning and, uh, and computer graphics. So, yeah. Here is um, one of our favorite users, Ian Messina, who is uh, at Studio Lab in New Hampshire. This is a disguise stage and big disguise user and Bolinga user. Uh, one of the early, early users of bringing environments into a volume. So that's a nerf on their stage being used. Yeah, exactly. That's how we can see the parallax here. Yeah, you could because clearly see the parallax even through an iPhone there. Um, and again, that's the whole promise is you're recreating a 3D environment, so you get the inherent benefits of a 3D environment. All right, talk, talk us through this one. This is a, a really cool one. This is one of our uses. Okay, this is, I'm going to tell you when nerf in, nerf out. And basically, what he wanted to do here is, we wanted to do this drone shot, but uh, we don't want to cross any drone. <laughs> we want to yeah, you can't put drone. a drone through a tight indoor corridor. Exactly. So this drone shot was simulated with Nerf, and then with clever editing, you edit it in with regular video footage. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you give the tool to creatives, they'll figure out all types of ways to use it. And uh, one more here. Okay, so this one, uh, shout out to Jason at NVIDIA for handing us these. So Google has their own Nerf solution for indoor spaces. Um, and I believe they're using it now for Google Maps. That's it. Yeah, so uh, five, six years ago, if you're using a Google Maps, you go into like a mall, you have no idea where you are inside that mall. So now they're figuring out how to do indoor location tracking with this. And uh, location scouting, super important for production, as you know. So you already have the set of images somewhere stashed already. You can just feed them through Volinga and generate this, or you can go out and shoot it. Exactly. Or ask your scouter to, to generate it on there for you. Yeah. OK. There's more. Here's another neat example of location scouting. You know, your production asks you to go to Italy and <laughs> recreate Italy and you take a bunch of photos, you bring it back and now you can have this walkthrough done by whoever. Uh, again, this is all done in photogrammetry before, nothing groundbreaking there, but the interesting thing here is the number of people involved, the number of hours needed is just so much less. Yeah. I would say here that there is a uh, a lot of work to do from, from you guys, from professionals, to figure out how to use this tool. Because we don't know yet the killer application and the really the, the killer use case within virtual production. If you think about it, you can use it for previs, you can use it for virtual scouting, you can use it uh, in different stages in your production, uh, even in post-production uh, with batch rendering. So. There are many possibilities, and while well, we are working with our customers, of course, and users, to figure out 
where it is most uh, profitable to use NERF. And uh, I, I think this is an exciting moment for professionals to embrace a new tool and to uh, check it out. Yeah, actually, one of the cool things we are seeing is that, for example, in this case, when you push NERF, let's say, too hard, and you go yeah. really, really Think right there. Yeah, yeah. Th there are people also using this for artistic content, like yeah. using these artifacts that NERF crea creates, which are called floaters. Uh, they use them for artist in a, a artistic way. We are developers, like, so we don't have this. They look <laughs> like a watercolor to me. It's like yeah. a Monet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so creatives are using the artifacting to their advantage. All right. And then next example. Okay, so this is a big one for industry use. Um, when you're training autonomous driving models, those AI models, they need to be trained on as accurate of a representation of the real world as possible. And right now, a lot of the training is done in like a game engine like Unreal. So you'd have to recreate San Francisco in Unreal and then have your autonomous vehicle drive through that digital city and learn how it behaves. It's actually way simpler to just capture San Francisco or, or it's already captured somewhere and just feed it through a nerf and now you have all of the depth perception, the parallax that's needed for self-driving vehicles. So this is uh, right from Waymo, and again, Jason at NVIDIA sent us this. Yeah, in NVIDIA, they are doing really cool uh, research on combining conventional 3D graphics with NERF in order to create um, a simulation of all those edge cases that the car may encounter. And notice all the uh, parked cars and any sort of distractions are removed on purpose, so this NERF was edited and that's because that's what the autonomous vehicles can handle at the time. So it's AI feeding AI. All right, now switching gears into virtual production and NERF. Um, so I'm just going to walk you guys through this one. This is sort of the slew of tools we have available here. Um, and each one of these tools have their time and place and when that's flexed. For example, like I was saying, you're building a beautiful sci-fi environment you have no choice but to really invest in a heavy, beautiful, unreal scene because you're going to need to modify it and create it in a very creative way. But if you're recreating a real world and it's only needed for one shot and you don't have that big of a budget, I think a nerf is an excellent option. Driving plates. Driving plates are used all day long for virtual production. As a matter of fact, I would say it's the number one use case for an LED volume, uh, the unsung hero of VP. Driving plates could be used as is, or it could be fed through Valinga, and it could generate a nerf. That's it, and you don't have to fight with the uh, camera calibration for our Yeah, uh, driving plates is actually really interesting because you already have a different vantage point, so typically, um, and I see uh, Greg in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> we have a driving plate expert right there. So you have nine, 10, 11 cameras that are looking at different parts of the road, you can feed those different perspectives right into a Nerf engine. And 2.5D, for those of you who don't know what 2.5D is, it's layering. Um, it's almost like layers in Photoshop and creating a almost a faux parallax. So again, uh, I talked about the importance of parallax. So when you have a significant camera move and it appears flat, your eyes will break it apart and it'll look fake. In those instances, it's best to have two and a half D, so multiple 2D layers, so you get that artificial parallax. And in a lot of instances, you can mix and match these things, so you can have a nerf all the way in the back, and then you can have a 3D object in front of it, and so on and so forth. And ju yeah, just to touch on driving plates, so we already have terabytes, petabytes of driving plate footage all over the world. It's all still good, it's still usable, it can get fed right in through a, a Nerf engine. And if you're recreating a real location, Nerf is an excellent use case there. With the quality that it, we're achieving today, it's already, I would say, usable. And as Nerfs increase in resolution, have less artifacts, it's only gonna get better and better. And the last thing, so, in the world of broadcast, there's always a need for uh, augmented reality objects that the uh, presenter interacts with. And 
most of those times, those AR elements are built by an artist, so like a football player or a graphic or so on. Those things could easily be captured using a nerf, so a very quick nerf pass to get that object into your platform and then overlaid on top of your broadcast. Yeah, for example, I think in, in a football player, you can use that camera rig that we are seeing exactly. back there, yep. capture the football player and you have it there. Yeah, just feed it through a nerf engine, right? All right, um, Orlando, talk us through what's coming down the pipe. So uh, we didn't say anything about uh, this part um, when we spoke about the things that we are working on, but this is editing. So the idea of, uh, and the fact is that we need to create new mathematical tools to manipulate these primitives. And this is a little bit uh, mind blowing because in 3D graphics, you know, we have had 40 years of research and development to develop all that, uh, you know, background and techniques. And, but in, for NERF, we need to research those. And one of the things that uh, we are ca um, figuring out is how to edit the radiant fields um, to, to do transference style, for example. That's what we are seeing here. But also to move objects around, to change the color of objects, uh, to enlarge objects. So all those tools that in our uh, 3D environments we give uh, for granted, that are already there, we are researching that um, and we are uh, implementing it, it in, into new tools and I'm putting them in the hands of, mm -hmm. of the professionals. And, but this is a very cool research. Um, I, I think there might have been a question. I think I saw somebody raise their hand. Was there a question? Questions? Okay. Well, Jess, we're going to get to questions in like a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. If that's all right. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So, uh, Fernando, walk us through the recoloring stuff. Yeah, as Orlando said, we have to develop new tools to, to do recoloring, for example, in NAFs. There are some cool works. I think this is from Adobe. Um, it's still a lot of work to have, have to be done, but we can see that we are getting there. Yeah. This is only a 3G technology, 3G are all technology. Let's wait and let's see what we have in, in a year. Also for the ed edition, this, this work is from yeah. Indria, an institute in France. And uh, again, you can see how now we can start modifying the objects. I mean, it uh, looks like there's vertices, but there really isn't. Yeah, we are, we yeah. exactly. <laughs> that, that's what it's yeah. all like. Yeah. We are trying to uh, simulate these vertices. Regarding the edition, we will be using, or one of the promises in paths here is to use machine learning diffusion models to edit uh, these radiance fields. So the same kind of technology or uh, machine learning models that we use for text to image or text to video are gonna be used, or we expect that that's gonna happen for getting text to nerve or for editing, in painting or out painting nerves. So, uh, but again, nerf is a, is a primitive computer graphics that those other methods are gonna change and generate and edit. Understood. All right, uh, where was that question? Let's get to it. Um, yeah, I'm curious, um, what's involved in um, installing one of these on a VP stage when it comes to camera tracking, calibration, scaling, and all like that? Yeah, great question. So this guy handles all those things you just said. So we have a central platform where the camera tracking data comes in, color profiles get loaded, spatial calibration, lens calibration, and so on. So you have this base platform that is now powering the stage check. How do you get a nerf in there? you download an NVOL asset from Volinga right into Disguise, and that NERV goes directly into that server. Yes, sir. Uh, I have like two simple questions. Uh, so first one, it, it, similar workflow with uh, photogametry. Uh, and you mentioned you know, the, the, how you take the imagery. Uh, is there any um, issues with 
certain kind of uh, compressions with the file, or is it what works in photogrammetry will work in nerfs? Is that good solid that's so it. I can future proof all the stuff I'm shooting? Exactly. That, that's it. If it works in photogrammetry, it will probably work on nerf. And then how does a model done in photogrammetry uh, compare to a nerf, say, as far as performance? Like for somebody that does a lot of virtual reality work, how do those two compare? Is it super hard for a computer to render a nerf hmm. versus what? what's the compare and contrast of those two? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Basically, right now we are working and researching towards real-time rendering on nerf and having better performance. Right now, you have to have a powerful GPU, NVIDIA GPU, um, to work. So that, that's why we see virtual production and audiovisual uh, production filmmaking as one of the first use cases of NERF. In photogrammetry, you can create, you can easily, let's say, create models that you have, you can run on, on virtual reality. You have to work on it, you have to optimize the model, but the thing is, you can optimize the model. In NERF, what you capture is what you get. That's really cool because you have reflections, you have complex uh, materials and complex light conditions. But now you cannot optimize this model or you can just optimize it a bit. And it still requires a, uh, a bit of research to make this run on, on a mobile phone, for example. Perhaps I can complement this. Uh, we need to think that uh, we right now, nowadays, we have a software stack and a hardware that is really optimized for moving polygons and for managing textures and for doing everything specific to the current 3D technology that we have, but we don't have that the same stack, mature one for NERF. So that's something that we are doing in Bolinga. We are optimizing the software stack to run NERF efficiently on GPUs. But in the future, we will have for sure cores specific for NERFs and uh, perhaps a, a replacement for CUDA perhaps uh, and specific for those cores. So we have here like a fight, you know, between um, this baby that is trying to, to get uh, into this uh, complex technological environment and something that, that is already there, which is a 3D meshes and conventional technology that runs very efficiently. And yeah, photogrammetry, you basically uh, reconstruct and and, and you translate the reality in, 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 in meshes and in textures. So, and, and now you have that software that is really optimized for moving that. Uh, so that's gonna be one of the challenges in, in, the, in the short term. We have one more question back here. Hi, Thank there. you all for being here. I had a question about the previous 360 video example. Can you tell me exactly what software you used for that? You mean the one that was generated using 360 images? Exactly. I think you said it was an yeah. Insta360 camera. This, this is yeah. This is from Great Eterna. Uh, I can tell you a little bit, but I don't know the details. I think he he used uh, MetaShape or IGSoft uh, to just unwrap the 360 images from Insta360, and they treated as individuals. I think eight different uh, normal images. And then he just uh, fit this into Bolinga, the, the pipeline of Bolinga, and it works. So the thing here is how do you turn these 360 images into, let's say, normal images. That's so I think he used Agisoft, but I, I cannot say for sure. Right, so basically just feeding equirectangular projections into That's the it. engine. Gotcha. Cool, thanks. We have uh, one. More? OK, one we more. We can take one more. So they had one question over here. Yeah, go for it. Right, so I'll just repeat the question a little bit. So how is all of the information video photo stored on a nerve solver? So yeah, that, that, that's the idea mainly. So, but the neural network is gonna learn those pixels and it's going to um, approximate the pixels that didn't see. So it's like, you can see it actually, th this is the same technique that uh, researchers are working on to compress images or to compress videos to learn things. And then the neural network is going to approximate things that didn't, that didn't see. Um, that's why also that, that, that's an important feature of this representation is that it's really, really compact. 
So independently from the complexity of the environment, you are gonna ha have the same number of parameters for your model and the same number of uh, bytes and the size. Yeah. And it's, you, you can reduce it in, in two orders of magnitude the size of the files that you need to use in comparison with conventional 3D. Well, so, for example, uh, a ner I did a nerf around the block that I live in. It's like 140 megabytes. It, you know, it's not mm. much. Just a quick follow-up. Have you ever considered, or do, do you do a photogrammetric pass on a nerf in order to establish geometry for some particular region that you want to manipulate? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, we and the academia are trying to do, like understand how to best use existing tools, existing tools for extracting geometry to combine it with NEFs. Because now once you have the, the, the three geometry, you have to translate these changes that you do to NEF, and that is the, let's say the hard part, uh, mathematically. We're all outside there, so please come ask us questions. We are out of time. I want to respect PSLA. Thank you very much for- Round of Thank applause. You. So who now understands what a nurse is?